Hello everyone at uh, Seattle Revival Center. Paul Keith Davis here. It's uh, great to be able to uh, make this little video for you and you know, maybe just share a few thoughts about what uh, the Lord has been saying to me and hopefully you'll be a, a blessing to those of you that are, that are there. Um, we sure love Darren and all the guys there. And, and uh, by the way, Darren, I appreciated uh, your humor and, and uh, your kindness too for uh, sending a little clip for my birthday. They surprised me with a, you know, one of these video uh, uh, ontologues, whatever it's called, montologue of um, different leaders, you know, quite a number. I was shocked at how many people would, were willing to take a few minutes and send me a, a, um, a little birthday wish. But Darren, I appreciate yours. I think yours was by far the funniest, so <laughs> you won that prize. But, uh, you know, I've been hearing a little, thing, a little noise about what's been going on out there, you know, the Lord's doing some stuff. I think that's outstanding. You know, uh, we're probably living in the most unique time in church history. You know, we probably could have said that last year and it would have been true. And we can say it again this year and it's still true again. Because with each passing year, um, we are faced with a unique set of circumstances spiritually. We're, we're faced with a unique set of circumstances politically, uh, socially, in every other way. And the Lord is in the middle of it. He is doing a, a number of things. And, and uh, you know, right now you can go as deep with God as you're willing to go. You know, I'm just going to say that up front. I... I have to be honest, Caleb and I were sitting here talking and I just didn't, I told him, I don't know how deep to go. I'm going to have to trust the Holy Spirit to, you know, let me know um, just how far along, you know, to go and what he's been teaching me. You know, I remember years ago, Bob Jones told me that my message was 10 years ahead of itself. I had written my first book and the book came out and I gave him a copy and he read it, which was a shock because he... He didn't read books. <laughs> and uh, he, said, uh, he said, this book is 10 years ahead of itself. And your message is 10 years ahead of itself. And I said, Bob, don't tell anybody that. You know, if you just wrote a book, you don't want somebody, you don't want a prophet making an announcement. It'll be relevant 10 years from now. So <laughs> yeah, don't wait about 10 years later. But uh, the reality is, the truth of the matter is, Thrones of the Soul is more relevant right now than it was when I wrote it. Every book that I have written has been more relevant. I'm not trying to say that to convey that I'm some sort of prophetic person, but it's just the reality that what I have said over the years in a public forum like that, for whatever reason, the Lord has chosen these 10-year cycles to... to um, to release things, and so I, 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 I don't believe what I'm about to share with you is going to happen 10 years down the road. What I believe what I'm going to share with you will begin now and will continue to culminate over the next several years. I want to say up front, you know, I know we have a lot of eschatology going around out there, and uh, since this is a recording, Darren, you can always... Uh, you can always edit this comment out if it's not in agreement with your eschatology. But, you know, I don't subscribe to the idea that we've got 100 years. I don't. I don't. I believe, in fact, that is a dangerous eschatology, a dangerous teaching. I believe that we need to be prepared for the return of the Lord now. I know He's not coming right now. I know He's not coming right now because the bride has not made herself ready just yet and the sons of the kingdom are not mature enough yet. I agree. The harvest has to come in. But we have to operate each and every day as if this is the day of the, of the Lord's return. We are living in the span of church history that we will see the Lord's return. I, I will go so far as to say and prophesy there are people within the sound of my voice that will likely live to see the Lord's return. I believe that. I believe that with all of my heart. And everything that I do is built around that premise. And I believe, I believe you can make a, a valid biblical uh, position on that very subject based upon the status of Israel, based upon the status of Jerusalem, 
just so many factors, the aligning of the nations and all the political things that have gone on, the social things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are many, many things. And so therefore, it's not a time to be complacent is my main point. This is not a time for complacency. This is not a time um, to be careless about our faith. Uh, I, was, I, was, I haven't done many meetings. I've been hidden away in a cave for three years. The most difficult three years of my life, to be honest. And most of you, or many of you may know, uh, I've had some, some pretty serious physical issues. I had, a, I had a major spinal surgery in 2016, and they wanted to do another one in, tw in 2017, but when I saw the big contraption they wanted to put inside my back, I told them, no way. They wanted to fuse these discs in my lower back and put this, this long titanium plates all, all the way up my spine. I said, are you kidding me? I'm going to believe God. So we're just believing God right now. I'm not having surgery. I'm doing all the different things that I can naturally, you know, to, to face uh, the issues that I have and believing God to take all this pain away. And, and he's doing it. He's doing it. He's helping me. Uh, but the reality is, this is a very serious time. And, it, and it's a time to know what you believe and to believe what you know. Meaning act upon what you know. I do believe we are front and center right in the middle of the book of Revelation. Now I'm just going to kind of throw some things out in a very broad stroke right now um, and kind of feel it out a little bit, you know. Um, I believe in the parties and I believe in the outpourings and I believe in the joy and I believe in the river and I believe in all the different teachings that are that are going on, but one thing I know, one thing I can tell you with absolute certainty right now, God is transforming a body of people and He will make them to rule and reign on planet Earth with the integrity, the power, and the character, and the nature of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now you mark that down. The Lord is looking for a remnant of people that are willing to pull aside right now. And I tell you what he's willing, to, what he's really looking for, and I can tell you this by experience, he's looking for those that are willing to just take their chest and pull it back and say, here it is, Lord, you know, begin to do what I need, you need to do. And I remember when I prayed that prayer, I didn't know what I was getting into. And I'm not trying to scare anyone off, but I tell you, it'll be, it's all going to be worth it. I'm praying, we're close to the end of it, that many that have been, you know, pulled aside into this secret place, are about to experience this transformation. I, I know it says in Philippians that our citizenship is not our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform us from our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory in conformity with the body of His glory through the exertion of the power He has to subject all things to Himself. Let me tell you something. We, we, we're, our God is not an impotent God. Our God is able to subject anything and everything to His will and His, His pleasure. Don't ever forget it. But our citizenship, and I think what we have to understand about that is we need to begin to live our life uh, from, from our heavenly zip code. We need to begin to see things from heaven's perspective more than we do. We need to see things as God sees them, and it changes our whole perspective. It changes our responses. It changes the way that we um, position ourselves to, to do the things that we do. Um, he, he's, he's looking for those that will make decisions in accordance with his heart. And, and, and you, can't you can't do that by going by what your natural eyes see. You have to do that by positioning yourself, being seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So our citizenship is in heaven. And we need to operate from that posture <clears throat> because we, 
we eagerly await a Savior. Here we are again, right back to the very point. We're waiting for the return. We're waiting for the age to come. Paul talked often in his teachings, the Apostle Paul, that, that he, he did things to influence the age in which he lived and the age to come. He had as much interest in the age to come as he had in the age in which he was living. And we have to understand that. And, and, and I have, I'm going I'm to talk here in just a moment, the Lord willing, because I have no idea where this message is going today. But it's about ruling and reigning with Christ Jesus. I'm going to come back to the citizenship is in heaven. I haven't forgotten. But it's about ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord right now has pulled a body of people aside. You can call them the mature sons of God. You can call them the huios sons of God. You can call them the bride of Christ, the remnant, that little beautiful remnant bride of Christ that all she wants to do is lay her head upon his breast. She's satisfied and content to be hidden away with him, but, but the Lord won't let her stay there because he has to push her out to do ministry, to bring, to bring in the harvest. I hope you heard what I just said. I'm not saying she's going to be hidden away from now until the return of the Lord, but her heart, her heart's cry is to be hidden away with God. To be hidden away with God. I tell you, this year it has been hard. I've only done a couple of meetings, but it's been hard for me to pull out of where I have been in order to, to go do some meetings. I did some in Smith Station, Alabama. And, uh, and, and, and it was, you know, I, I didn't want, I wanted to stay home. I wanted to stay home until this process is done. This process is done. I had a visionary encounter just a few weeks ago. Well, it's July now, July the 24th to be exact. So whatever number of weeks that was away, everything seems current to me right now. But, but July the 24th of 2017, I had this experience and I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but I saw, I saw a remnant of people that came out of a metamorphosis. And that's literally what I saw in my vision. They were in cocoons. They came out of cocoons, literally in my vision. <laughs> if you can imagine seeing grown people coming out of a cocoon, but that's exactly what I saw. And and, and this angel was standing there, and it's a beautiful angel in white. It's one of the few angels I've ever seen that literally had a female, looked like a woman. Uh, most, I have seen some that had very warlike, uh, I'm not meaning to imply I've seen a lot of angels, but on a few occasions I've seen some angels that were very warlike and scary, and I've seen some that looked like ordinary people. And then when I saw the angels that gather, they looked very inviting, very friendly. But this looked like a woman. The only time I've ever seen an angel that actually, actually looked like a woman or the features of a woman. Let me put it that way. And she was showing me where these people were coming from. And they were coming out of this cocoon of God. God had them in this cocoon where they were, where they were being processed, where they were being uh, transformed, where they were being molded, shifted, changed through a very painful process. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you, if you're not, if you're, you know, and this may, this may fly in the face of some of the, some of the movements of the church right now, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I know Darren loves me. But if you're not experiencing a little bit of pain right now, I have to wonder about your walk with God. If you're not experiencing a little bit of tribulation and trials, I have to, you know, I love the glory. I love the happiness and the joy in the, in the river. And I, oh boy, I, I, would, I would love to live in the river forever. I would love to eat cotton candy every day. But cotton candy will eventually make you, the cotton candy will not make you a strong, mature son of God. It takes the trials of fire. It takes being tested, your faith being tested and and, and, and going through some things, uh, betrayals or whatever. I don't want to be betrayed, and I'm not prophesying betrayal, but the reality is it's going to happen. There are trials. There are, there are, look at every one of, every one of the, the, the overcoming blessings to the churches of Asia Minor, to him that overcomes. 
You know, I have to wonder sometimes if the Apostle Paul were to walk into our churches today, would he recognize the gospel that we preach? And I'm not saying that to be critical. I'm saying that to challenge us to get back to the Bible, to understand where we live. We are living in the last days, the greatest day in the history of the church where there will be the greatest outpouring of the Spirit the church has ever seen. But that outpouring of the Spirit will not fall upon immature children that don't know how to steward the weapons of our warfare, but it will fall upon a mature body of people that know exactly what the heart of God is and exactly what to do with the living word. And that's what I'm calling this, the living word. Not just reciting some words out of a page that sound good, not just doing this charismatic thing we used to do, but I'm talking about people that have the living word in their mouth. That They're like Samuel. When you come into a town, I mean this sincerely, that when these mature sons of God come into a town, the leaders of the town are coming out saying, are you coming to bless us? Are you coming with something that's not a blessing? Because I know the word that's in your mouth is the living word. It is thus saith the Lord. And the good news is the Lord is desiring today to speak life. But it's going to be through a body of people that have that he have been through a metamorphosis, a transformation, if you will. You know, I've been doing this teaching, and and here again, Darren. You know, if you get if you get a little shuffle on this, you know, I'm I'm sorry. But uh, but we have such a gross misunderstanding of the of the term adoption that we see primarily in Romans chapter eight. And, and people say, you know, they have this mentality, this 20th and 20th century perspective of adoption, that, that we are adopted into God's family. Isn't that wonderful that we were out there, you know, orphans, and God in His grace and His love and His mercy saw us orphans out there, and, and in, in His love He adopted us into His family and gave us all the rights and privileges of his children. That is false teaching. That is false teaching. The word adoption is the word huiothesia, and it applies to someone that's already become a son, not someone that is going to become a son. You receive the spirit of adoption because you are a son, not not in order to become a son. That is the truth. It is, the t- it is the taking of a son, one that has accepted. How, how do I know that? How do I know that? Because the Bible says in 1 John 3 that if I am born of God, the seed of God abides in me. The seed, the sperma seed, that's what it says. Look it up for yourself. 1 John chapter 3. If you're a son of God, the seed of God abides in you, the sperm seed of God. That's what it says. I'm not using a word that's not in the Bible. Look it up in your own Strong's Dictionary. The sperma seed of God abides in you. So if God's seed is in me, then what need do I have to be adopted? Because He's already my Father. My my Father didn't have to adopt me into the Davis family because his seed was already in me. I was already a Davis. I was born a Davis. So there there was no need to have an adoption ceremony. But in the context of the human, just human sonship, if you were to put it that way, because I did have the seed of God in me, then the spirit of, of adoption that's placed upon me is to take me from an infant, from a child, from an adolescent, mature me, grow me, discipline me, put me through different trials of life so that eventually he can positionally place me as a mature huios son of God and give me all of the authority of my father's house. Let me prove it to you. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I think think it's uh, verse 15. Let me make sure. Yep, that's correct. For if you have... Let me start over. 
For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. When? All right, you've become a Christian. You've become a, a believer. You've accepted the blood of Jesus Christ. Now Paul is saying, now, you have not received a spirit of fear. You have not received a spirit of slavery. You've become a son of God, so therefore you have not received a spirit of fear. You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. When you became a Christian, when you became a believer, the seed of God was already in you before the foundation of the world. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. He, he knew you before the foundation of the world. Those whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the very image of His Son. That means He saw every person before He created planet Earth that would say yes to His Son. He saw them. He saw them. Every person before He ever created planet Earth they would ever turn their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, yes, He saw them and put a seed in them before the foundation of the world. That's what the Bible teaches. That's not what all the churches teach, but that's what the Bible teaches. And as a result of that, when, you, when that revelation is, when the light has struck the seed, you realize that you no longer are, are living in slavery you're no longer a slave to sin and fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. It's a revelation. He is our Father. You're my Father. I love the passage uh, when the Lord Jesus was, was resurrected and you know Mary was looking in the tomb and saw the empty tomb and was weeping and this devoted, wonderful woman, you know. And uh, the Lord Jesus is standing there and she doesn't recognize him. And, and, uh, and she, she says to him, do you know where they took his body? Do you know where they've laid him? Can you imagine the scene? Just imagine what that scene must have been like. And, and finally he speaks to her and, he, and she recognizes who it is and oh, she's clinging to him and holding on to him and saying, I, I'm never going to let go. And he's, stop clinging to me. I got, I've got to go somewhere. But no, he didn't quite say it like that. But stop clinging to me for I must go to my father and your father. There it is. Jesus Christ came out of the grave and as a result of the resurrection of the Son of God, not only could He say, I'm going to my Father, He could turn to Mary and to you and I and say, and to your Father. I am going to my Father and to your Father. He made no distinction. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't portray her as a second-class child of God, as a, as a subordinate of course, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God because He is God. But He says, I'm going to my Father and your Father. That means the very same Father that He taught about when He walked the earth in human form is my Father. That means that I should be able to talk about my Father the way He talked about His Father. Which leads me to believe that I would need to have access to my father like he had access to his father. To be able to, how else can I talk about him? How else can I convey his heart? How else can I say I do nothing but what I see my father doing? And I say nothing but what I hear my father saying if I don't have access to my father. So he says, I'm going to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Listen to what it says in verse, I believe it's verse 23, I hope it is. Not only this, but also we ourselves, listen carefully to this language. Not only this, 
but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Okay? Are we waiting eagerly to become a Christian? Are we waiting eagerly to become a huios, son of God? Listen carefully. The reason I'm being so careful with this, because I've had people question this, because we've had such an indoctrination. There has been such an indoctrination because people haven't understood sonship. That we think adoption means God has adopted us into his family. We become a son of God because he adopted us. That is not the case. The word adoption is huiothesia. Huiothesia. You have to have a little whistle in it. Huiothesia. The placing of a son. That's what it means. Look it up. Get your Strong's Dictionary. Find out if it's not true. The placing of a son, not the becoming of a son. So therefore, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. You know what that means? If if you're not groaning, if if you're not compelled, I wanted to use the word striving, but striving has this negative connotation. If you're not energized, if you're not driven, if you're not interested, if you're not doing all that is within your power to become a mature, recognized as a mature huios son of God, then you're not, then you're not responding to the spirit of adoption the way you should. Because it is, right now, the spirit of adoption is being poured out. The spirit of adoption is being poured out upon you as I'm speaking. The spirit of adoption is being poured out on the church right now because it is compelling us out of infancy. It is compelling us out of the silliness of what has become 20th and 21st century Christianity. It is driving us into the secret place of the Most High. It is driving us into the very presence of the living God. It is driving us into the heart of the Father. (coughs) excuse me, to discover the very heartbeat of God. The spirit of adoption is driving you into a place where you can become a mature son of God and he can put his seal upon you and place upon you ruling and reigning authority. I said all of that to get to the place where I can tell you that that's how you do it. If you're going to rule and reign with Christ, and by the way, let me just say it, not everybody will. Not everyone will qualify. It's to him that overcomes. Read for yourself. Read the book of Revelation. It's to him that overcomes. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame to sit with my Father. To him that overcomes. If you're not overcoming something, you're not living the 21st century Christian life. If you're not overcoming something, spiritual immaturity, if you're not overcoming woundedness, if you're not overcoming offense, if you're not overcoming all these things that we get so boggled down in that drive pastors crazy. (laughs) I talk to these pastors sometimes and I, I feel so bad for some of them sometimes. I'm like, my goodness gracious, I don't know if I could do that all day long. And most all of it could be answered if they would just overcome and become a mature believer and and not be so overwhelmed by somebody hurting your feelings or someone getting the credit when you did the job or whatever else all these things are. they, They matter not. What matters is how much of Christ is in you. How much of Christ has been formed in you. That's all that matters. To what degree have you overcome so that he can put his authority upon your life so that, yes, you can have some authority in this life and in the age to come? Because I'm telling you, I'm I'm telling you, the Lord is preparing a body of people who will very soon rule planet Earth. 
Now you might say that sounds ridiculous. It is not ridiculous if you read the Bible. If you are a Bible believer, you have to believe that Jesus Christ is going to return in the not too distant future. And He's going to set His throne up in Jerusalem. And those that have overcome in this earth will, will also sit on that throne with Him and He will give to them differing measures, differing measures of authority depending upon how much of, how much of Him was formed in them while they walked the, the earth. How much did they yield to the spirit of adoption to allow themselves to become the mature Son of God that creation is groaning and waiting to see? All of creation is groaning, waiting for a body of people to allow the spirit of adoption to come on their, their lives and to do all that is necessary in them to come out of that place as a mature son of God to wield the living word out of their mouth like a sharp two-edged sword dividing asunder spirit from soul like bone from marrow judging and discerning the very thoughts and intents of the heart. That's exactly what it will do. And they'll begin to, to release kingdom authority on planet Earth. I, I guess I ended up getting a little deep, didn't I, Darren? But this, this, is where, this is where I've been living. This is what the Lord has been teaching me. This is what uh, the last three years of my life have been have been about you know I don't have another message I, I I don't know if you can see it or not but I've got like five different sets of notes here and I just thought do I share what's in my heart do I share what God's been t telling me for for three years or do I pick one of these nice messages that I've done here that might sound pretty good and you know everybody would say that was a good message and and uh, nobody would ever know any different but but you know what? Um, I, I feel like I have to share my heart. You know, the spirit of adoption is on me. The spirit of adoption is on you. I know some of you in the room right now that are listening to me, you know what I'm talking about. You may not have had the language. You may not have known how to describe it. You may not have known how to articulate it, but you know now that what's on you is the spirit of adoption because you have not been allowed to get away with what you used to get away with. And I don't just mean nonsense in living either. I'm talking about spiritually speaking. I'm talking about how much time you spend with God. You can't just give God a passing prayer in the morning and go about your day. Why? Because the spirit of adoption is on you, compelling you into the secret place, compelling you into a place where you get into the presence of God and He begins to, to reach down inside of you. And pull stuff out that you didn't even know was there. Where he makes you conf confront and face the, the horrible mistakes of your life and deal with the issues. Not just say, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. He'll make you go in there. I, you know, I lost my wife. <laughs> and God has just, that made me say, oh, I'm sorry. He's made me go into this secret place to deal with the very root issue. So that you become a different person. That's what the spirit of adoption is doing. The spirit of adoption is pulling you aside so he can talk to you and change you. And Sometimes you might think he is, it's a little rough, but it's not. It's not a little rough. It's because He wants you to come out on the other side so He can give you all. We've heard the blessings. We've heard these wonderful things. You know, people, you know, in my experience that I re referenced that happened, I saw every one of the people that came out of the metamorphosis, they were anointed with Acts 10.38. Every one of the ones, every one came out anointed with Acts 10.38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with Him. 
You want to know one reason why the world can't hear our message? Because they're so oppressed and hurt and sick and downtrodden that they can't even hear what you have to say. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed, and to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Do you hear how much of that is healing? Bind the brokenhearted, recovery of sight to the blind, proclaim liberty to captives, setting at liberty those that are oppressed. Why? Because if you're oppressed, if you're blind, if you're brokenhearted, if you're sick, you can't hear the good news because you're so overwhelmed with your issues. I'm talking about the world out there, so there has to be a body of people today. You know, most of the revivals we have 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 just been the church enjoying revival. But you know what? There is a hurting world out there that the Lord Jesus Christ died for. And in, in our formulas and our isms and schisms and and dogmas and traditions and all that's not going to do them any good. They want somebody to go out there and set them free. (laughs) They want somebody to bind their broken heart because they've lived 35 years with a broken heart. They don't even know what it's like to feel peace. They don't even know what it's like to feel joy. They've been so broken hearted. They have been so oppressed by the devil. They don't know what it's like to live one single hour of freedom because nobody has been able to set them free from the chains and the bondage and the oppression of the devil. Jesus did. Jesus did. That's what he did first. He healed the sick. He delivered the oppressed. <laughs> Can't believe him. He had these massive healing meetings where everybody was healed. And if everybody is healed and everybody's broken heart is bound, then, then he has their attention. Then he can sit down on the side of a hill and say the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. He can sit down in a group of people and tell them about his father. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. That's what I want. That's what God's after. God anointed Darren Stott (laughs) with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he just went about doing good. Healing all who oppressed of the devil. Why? Because God was with him. If God is with you, you're going to set the captives free. You're going to heal the oppressed. Not only this, back to Romans 8, not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit. See, the Pentecostal experience is just first fruits. What I'm talking to you about is the promised land. What I'm talking to you about right now is mature sonship. Not first fruits, not Pentecost, tabernacles. Tabernacles, that's actually what I was going to talk about some today, but I obviously have gone a different direction. I, I haven't looked at one note just yet. I'm just kind of sharing from my heart right now. But, and I probably, not sure how long I've been going. I forgot to look at the clock. But, but, but we're moving out of Pentecost. We're moving into tabernacles. First fruits is... Is wonderful. That's nice, but it's in the wilderness. 
and were not called to live in the wilderness. Israel was not called to live in the wilderness. All that they experienced is a type and a shadow when they were in the wilderness was a picture of uh, Pentecost. Pentecost allowed leaven. Pentecost allowed mixture. But in tabernacles, there is no mixture. There is a crossing over into a land a mature body of people who know how to handle the weapons of warfare, that know how to kill giants, that know how to occupy. We're moving, spiritually speaking, into the Feast of Tabernacles because we're going to leave Mount Sinai. We're going to cross Jordan River. And yes, there are giants there. And yes, we've got to confront them. And the, and the reason He has called a body of people aside right now to prune them and prepare them and, and do all whatever it is He's doing to you you know, not everybody has to go through as severe things as I have, maybe because I'm maybe a little more hard-headed. I don't know what, what, what criteria is used to, de to determine what a person goes through. But what I do know with absolute certainty is that God is looking for maturity. He's looking for mature sons in God whose character is a reflection of His own. That I know. That much I know. Not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit um, <clears throat> groan. We groan. I want to go over across the river. I'm not born to live in the wilderness. I, I'm, un, I'm uncomfortable in the wilderness. I'm uneasy in the wilderness. This is not my home in the wilderness. I, I can see my home. It's on the other side of the river. There is my, my destiny. There is my life. There is my purpose over there across the river. But I've got to go through the Jordan. I've got to go through death to get there. And I'm groaning to cross over into that land. Every fiber of my being, and yours too, I'm sure many of you, not everybody, not everybody, not everybody will, not everybody wants it, not everybody will pay the price. Not everybody, but for a number of you, we're groaning. We are bones groan. I'd like to say something, but I know if I do, I'll get emotional. To groan. To be in His presence. Really in His presence. Not just a nice... I'm talking about in His presence where there is the fullness of joy. We groan to stand in the presence of the Father. I have had that. I was allowed for a few minutes to stand in perfect love, in the presence of the Father, perfect love. And it was beyond the comprehension of words And I groaned to get back. My blood cells groaned. My bones groaned. The marrow of my bones groaned to get back into that place of perfect love. I called it the haven of love. Perfect love. God is love. God is love. <clears throat> it's as simple as that. What is God? He's love. <laughs> if you get in the presence of the Father, it's an all-consuming fire. You know what that fire is? Love. Love. And He wants that love to be burning in His bride for His Son. That's what He's really wanting. Wanting. He is going to have it. The Father will have a body of people on planet earth called the Bride of Christ who have burning in their breast perfect love because it will be the love for the bridegroom. Nothing less. Will, nothing, he will, the Father will give nothing less than that to His Son for the reward of His sufferings. 
a bride whose breast burns with perfect love. You might say, oh, I, I love everybody. You have no idea what perfect love is about until you've stood in the presence of it. Cannot, I could not comprehend it. I'm not trying to imply to you I'm a spiritual person. But you cannot describe it, but it is the most. There is the absence of anything that would pollute that environment. It is impossible for fear to exist in perfect love. It is impossible for anxiety to exist in that realm, in that place. And he wants to take a little piece of that perfect love, a little piece of his own heart, the heart of the Father. That's the way I've seen it. He wants to take a little piece of his own heart and put it in the breast of the bride of Christ and let her burn on planet earth for a short season of time to bring in the greatest harvest of souls this world has ever seen. And they won't be shallow salvations. They will have been people that have been in the presence of the living God. And they will have been transformed and changed. That's what I started out with. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we wait eagerly, eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our humble state into conformity. He will take us from who we are and make us just like Him. What is that? Perfect love. Perfect love. He will change us from our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory. I feel that on me right now. Through the exertion of the power He has to subject all things to Himself. Don't ever forget, He has the power to subject all things. He has the power to subject my will to himself if I just let him. I'll try to finish this one more time. <laughs> Having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. The redemption of our body. So I'm not waiting eagerly for the adoption to become a son. I'm waiting eagerly for the spirit of adoption because I am a son to place me in a place where spirit, soul, and body, I have been redeemed. The Lord was pretty serious when he said we have these precious and magnificent promises by which we um, I, I lost it there for a second. We have these precious and magnificent promises. Um, <clears throat> First Peter 1 Peter 1.4. I had another thought go through my mind. We have these precious and magnificent promises by which we become partakers. Let me say it over. For we have these precious and magnificent promises by which we become partakers of the divine nature. That we become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption of this world and its lust. That will happen when you become a fully adopted son of God, a huios son of God, huiosthesia. The spirit of adoption has placed you as a son. You will have escaped the corruption of this world and its lust. And that's why all of creation groans for you to manifest yourself on planet Earth. All of creation groaning for a body of people that are not subject to the lusts of this world. They have Acts 10.38 on their life and they're not going to be seduced by money they're not going to be seduced by lust. They're not going to be caught up in a hotel room with someone that's not their wife. 
They're not going to fall into all the snares and traps and ploys and all the different things that have, that have captured so many. These people will have escaped the corruption of this world because they have lived their life out of the secret place of the Most High and they abide under His shadow. There is a place to escape all of these things in, the world, uh, in this world, and that is under the shadow of the Almighty. Well, amen. I hope, uh, I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope, uh, you know, we do, we do a number of webinars. If you're interested in hearing some more about what I have been teaching lately, you can go to the White Dove Ministries uh, YouTube channel. We have 70-something webinars. I don't know how many blogs we've got. But in the webinars, I've been teaching out of the book of Revelation, sharing a lot of this type stuff. And if you're interested, I'm not trying to do a, uh, an advertisement. I'm just simply saying if you have questions and would like a place to access to maybe gain some more answers, you can go to our YouTube channel and hopefully you'll find some of that. So, Lord, I release your anointing over these people. I release the spirit of adoption. I pray, Lord, that you would awaken everyone, everyone that is intended to live this life with you. Awaken them with love. Awaken them with passion. May they groan within themselves to no longer stay where they are, but to go where they need to be. I release that on you right now, and I feel the Holy Spirit on that. That right now, a number of you, and whoever would hear, hear happens to hear this. I don't even know who's going to hear it, but whoever happens to hear it, that when this Spirit falls on you, something in you is going to groan within you to compel you from where you are in the direction to where you need to be. If that one thing alone happens from this service, then a great, great Victory has already been achieved. I release that to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.